not just women are in danger, but all marginalized people. Where being uniquely different right now might truly be considered a crime. It seems as though we had all slipped into a false sense of comfort that justice would prevail and that good would win in the end. Well, good did not win this election. But good will win in the end. So what today means is that we are far from the end. Today marks the beginning, the beginning of our story. The revolution starts here. The fight for the right to be free, to be who we are, to be equal. Let's march together through this darkness and with each step know that we are not afraid. That we are not alone. That we will not back down. That there is power in our unity and that no opposing force stands a chance in the face of true solidarity. And to our detractors that insist that this march will never add up to anything, Boston Red here with Friday Java, a weekly magazine of political theory, polling, and commentary. It is part of the people history called people that make up this fascinating journey. We are part of the Obama network. For that, we make no apologies. What we pledge to do is give you the facts on a bridge to history, what body politics is, the most up-to-date theories of political science and cephalic. Stay tuned for this incredible ride. Boston Red, peace out. Friday Java. On the 3rd of May, 2019, from WBRN Radio and on the Boston Red Network. Boston Red here in the Jerry Pippen Broadcast booth. Very interesting uh, Friday. We'll recap uh, some of the events here. We'll start with uh, just a brief summary of the jobs report. Now, we have Numbers Man coming up this weekend, part of our WBRN uh, Boston Red Network coverage our macroeconomics program, and we'll go over this uh, in a much more uh, detail than what we have at this point in time. Let me just look here. This is called Employment Situation. This is put out by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. It basically, we'll give the job numbers here, and this is much more important than the uh, Mueller report. The number of jobs increased by 263,000, that's in April, compared with an average of, uh, gain of 213,000 over the past 12 months in April. Notable job gains occurred in professional and business services, construction, health care, and uh, social assistance. Now, let me just briefly look at this um, in terms of... Uh, Manufacturing, we'll just hit this one. Manufacturing uh, gained little, the third month in a row, plus uh, 4,000 jobs, uh, 12 months. Uh, prior to uh, February, the industry added 22,000 jobs per month. Now, this is something that the present administration has highlighted. It has not occurred, uh, basically speaking there. A little bit uh, different. Uh, financials actually outdid it by uh, 12,000 uh, jobs. Social assistance, uh, 26,000 jobs. Health care, which uh, the Republicans had said would not uh, bear fruition after the Affordable Care Act, 27,000 jobs in April. 
404,000 over the last 12 months in April job groups occurred. In uh, medical centers, 8,000 community health care facilities for the elderly by uh, 7,000. We'll go over this on uh, numbers, man. Uh, construction, obviously, uh, with the winter in many parts of the U.S., in abeyance, uh, 33,000 jobs there. This is basically a pinned-up uh, demand uh, period. Uh, a lot of building going on. Uh, 22,000 in what's called uh, non-residential trade. Uh, heavy construction, 10,000 there. Construction added uh, 256,000 over the last 12 months of last year. So it's important to look at that. We thought we would highlight this because really this is uh, the biggest part of uh, the re-election campaign is uh, the employment uh, situation participation rate rate was down what two tenths percent uh, a little bit there we'll go into this later but uh, as to where uh, things are uh, employment overall uh, with uh, teenagers at 13 percent they've been there African Americans at 6.7 percent showed a little no change there uh, period for men, 3.4%. For women, 3.1%. Uh, for European, 3.1% overall. Now we look at um, the unemployment rate declined actually by two tenths point to 3.6% uh, in April, lowest since um, December of, of 1969. Now, uh, be very, very careful uh, when you compare 1969 to uh, 2019 because the economy was uh, much, much uh, smaller at that time. Let me just throw one other thing in here while we're on this. Uh, Warren Buffett, which will have his uh, Woodstock for the uh, financial community in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, tomorrow morning. They kicked that off. And basically what he said was... Uh, he didn't think that present economic conditions with regard to fiscal and monetary policy can coexist with really low interest rates over time. And uh, and I agree with him on that. That will not happen. I don't think our present conditions can exist in terms of fiscal monetary policy and various other elements of the political landscape. I don't think uh, they can coexist with really low interest rates over time. And this is a, a contradiction. This is where we bring it on the political side to what the administration has been dreaming of, trying to actually lower the interest rate that is there at the present time, just doesn't simply just doesn't work. He goes on to say, I could be wrong. Now, one place I would disagree with him, he said uh, he thinks there is uh, nobody better to run the Fed than uh, Jerome uh, J. Powell or Jerome Powell. We'll have incident this weekend, the uh, news conference by the Fed chair, uh, Jerome Powell, um, somewhere along the line there, and hopefully we'll have some coverage of uh, the uh, Berkshire Hathaway meeting in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, it will be uh, televised, at least the uh, audio part of it. I'm not sure why they don't. Via the Yahoo network, it, it normally always is. So we'll we'll get that one way or the other and get it uh, to you. We'll wait tomorrow. Uh, in the morning, I'm not sure about how that will affect things, but uh, and we'll roll along. Incidentally, in this broadcast, we also have uh, Nate Silver, the people at the Crystal Ball. Nate Silver talking about poll, poll side. Very important there. And where the candidates are at this particular time in uh, the uh, scheme of things. The Crystal Ball assessing electability. You've heard that before. They particularly uh, use that phrase when uh, talking about candidates such as uh, Joe uh, Lunchbox or Lunchpail or Biden. And Democrats are trying to figure out uh, who is uh, best to beat uh, DJ Trump. A difficult task there. This is by Carl uh, Kyle Klondick. Uh, the key points from this. Trump's victory in uh, 2016 presents a uh, great uh, counter-argument to the idea that campaign professionals and pundits can uh, competent, 
to, to Lee uh, determine in advance who is electable to uh, the presidency and who is not. There's no doubt about it. Uh, things have uh, changed uh, materially in terms of the idea of electability. Most people who wrote uh, D.J. Trump off is not being electable. But however, given the uh, conditions and malpresses, uh, political malpresses by the campaign of Hillary the Monster Clinton and various voter suppression, the FBI was there. In other words, all the factors that uh, could uh, destroy a campaign were all there. And now this fixation with uh, the interference by the Russian Federation is way overblown what uh, interfered with the campaign more than anything else was voter suppression in many of the states. Uh, Florida, for example, uh, and North Carolina. Voter suppression uh, costs a few points in the poll and that changes the whole uh, dynamic uh, there. And then you had uh, states like Wisconsin at the time were under the administration of Boss Walker and his voter suppression uh, regime. In Michigan, they had Gateway Snyder he had his own voter uh, suppression operation going on. And in Pennsylvania, the Republicans had gerrymandered as many districts as they could. Now, what this does is it creates a, a lot of artificial uh, type of uh, voter uh, preference, as we can use that term. And this is one of the things you look at is very, very important as to how the legislation goes. And what is stacking up at this point in time, uh, you have neoliberals like uh, Joe uh, Lunchpail uh, Biden. Some say is only a Lunchpail in uh, disguise as a Brooks Brothers suit type, a generic type of, uh, of suit. But beyond that, this whole fixation, uh, even on the working class, and Nate still will get into this when you look at the trade unions, uh, there are various components to the trade union and movement, no doubt about it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But back to the uh, crystal ball. Uh, many presidents, this is one of their talking points beyond Trump, have seemed unelectable at uh, various points in their uh, ultimately successful campaigns. Bill Clinton was one of those. They thought they got a wild bill in a New Hampshire with various women. didn't uh, matter. But that was a freeway race uh, between he, uh, Bush, and uh, Ross Perot, Dallas, Texas. As, Repu as Democrats consider who's the best, uh, who has the best chance against a uh, DJ Trump, they will have to sort uh, through different kinds of electability arguments. Uh, one of which uh, may be right or wrong. One uh, which will be actually uh, be tested. The perils of determining who is electable and who is not. It's a very conservative Republican Party can't win a national election. Gerald Ford speaking about a uh, Reagan. It was in uh, 1980. I think he's got a big electability problem. This is Jerry Brown speaking about Bill Clinton during uh, March 15th. Uh, debate uh, in 1992. If only Jerry Brown knew. And Jerry Brown said he was running for the right of uh, Clinton, who was already on the right. <laughs> we are not exactly sure where the uh, awkward word electability entered the uh, national uh, lexicon. Uh, voters and parties began making a, a pre-election assessment about who is likely to win and who is not. Concerned about electability are uh, dotted through American uh, history and have sometimes led uh, party leaders to consider alternatives to national front runners. Alternatives can go uh, on uh, to become historically important presidents. And they name a few here, but uh, William Stewart, uh, let's see, what did William Stewart do? He ended the race, that was in 1860, uh, as a presidential nominee uh, as a favor. A favor, excuse me, but the question about his uh, perceived weaknesses in critical states. Uh, 
and let's see turning uh, excuse me formed a uh, growing a cloud on uh, the horizon uh, of his anticipated nomination uh, McPherson he's a, a civil war historian pregnancies from all uh, regents and uh, politicians uh, from uh, doubtful states combined uh, in a stop steward uh, movement McPherson wrote Stewart uh, led on the first ballot uh, at the Republican convention, but the third ballot went on to a man who emerged uh, from a position as a dark horse to become the nominee. His name was Abraham Lincoln. He was from Illinois. Like the building concerns about uh, Robert Taft, he was from Ohio, known as Mr. Republican, also informed of the uh, decision of the Republican leaders to draft I Like Ike. I like Ike, incidentally, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, General Eisenhower, uh, was supposedly at the time uh, non-aligned uh, with any party, and both parties actually wanted him to run. Electability is clearly in the minds of Democrats as uh, they determine who gets a nod to challenge uh, D.J. Trump. A few weeks ago, the Huff and Puff Post, uh, Kevin uh, Rivlard, Ribelard, um, and let's see here, uh, and um, Amanda uh, Tretke, or Tretted, anyway, explored the idea of electability in the Democratic primary. The perception of which uh, candidates uh, stand for the best chance of topping uh, Trump. Uh, will uh, play a major uh, role in deciding who ultimately wins the Democratic Party's nomination according to uh, polling and interviews with campaigns, operatives, rank-and-file voters, etc. But many of those are perceptions and theories. Joe Biden could win back of the Rust Belt. Elizabeth Warren is a bit like uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, that is just farcical. Bernie uh, Sanders could win West Virginia. I, I would agree with that. Bernie has a very good chance of winning uh, West Virginia and are uh, based on uh, a flimsy evidence and the unlike, uh, and unlikely the uh, simple question of whom voters uh, like the most. The question of elect- electability involves evaluating what other people uh, might like and uh, what uh, voters and even political operatives aren't great at. Kellyanne Conway, she appears in this article. She's counsel to D.J. Trump and his campaign manager was during the last months of the uh, 2016 uh, cycle. Spoke at the University of Virginia's um, Politics American Democracy Conference. After the victory, she uh, questioned the ability of campaign operatives and observers to truly figure out who is electable and who is not. What happens early in uh, the process is people say so and so and so is electable, he uh, can win, and uh, virtually every. Uh, whoops. Let me see here. Oh, and you, uh, you are uh, very uh, potentially should ask, okay, great. How do you know that? Uh, well, a hundred other people uh, just uh, selected it on TV. Anyway, uh, certainly uh, Trump's victory is a great argument against the idea of so-called electability. Then itself, as it applied to D.J. Trump uh, from the very beginning... Uh, as he moved through the uh, Republican primary and eliminated various opponents like Joe Lewis did and basically the chump of the week uh, operation it was apparent that he had a style that was uh, attuned to the present uh, day anger in the American electorate and given uh, the organization of the Republican National Committee 
the Koch brothers and others, uh, voter suppression, he had a very good chance of pulling that off. And the error was that uh, the Democratic Party assumed that uh, Hillary Clinton could win this, and her stratagem for winning it was uh, flawed. In fact, she spent too much time in Florida, didn't go to Wisconsin, didn't spend time in Michigan, didn't spend time cultivating the followers of O.J. Simpson, and a lot of things were just amiss in her campaign. As Laura Retton of the New Republic put it, this was in a 2016 piece from the last stage of the Republican Party about Ted Line Cruz and John Cruzek uh, arguing that they were the most electable. Well, Ted Line Cruz was not electable. Uh, John uh, Kirsch, why did I say Cruz? John Kirsch, he was the Ohio governor would have been a more electable, a less drama, because, again, he'd been in the Congress and, of course, the governor of Ohio. He could carry Ohio. But for many, if most Republicans, electability had come to look like a way uh, to vote for compromise, the party's principal would lose the general election. They were referring back to Will Romney, but Will Romney had other problems. There are some problems with this argument for conservatives, Politics is often about uh, timing and uh, the uh, political conditions in uh, 2016 for D.J. Trump. Uh, open seat election coming off a two-term uh, Democratic president with relatively mediocre approval rate, no doubt about that. We're better than those uh, for uh, John McCain, the late John McCain in 2008 and Willard Romney in 2012, the former uh, Had uh, to deal with the weight of uh, G.W. Bush's unpopular presidency, but he had to deal also with the depression. Um, faced uh, the uh, invaluable uh, task of running against an incumbent president. Obama now uh, seems uh, very uh, fair to say was also uh, a, a uh, superb campaigner. There's no doubt about this. Hillary Clinton was not in the, uh, didn't have the charisma of uh, Barack Obama. No one did at that point in time. One can argue that because of the uh, extenuating circumstances, McCain and Romney, uh, who lost, uh, were uh, more electable than Trump, uh, who won. But uh, in fact, it's a kind of a silly argument because of what actually happened. Yes, perhaps. Romney and McCain would have uh, won in uh, 2016, and Trump would have uh, lost in uh, 28. No doubt about it. Uh, DJ Trump could not beat Barack Obama in 212, 28, or 2020. Uh, just would not happen there. Uh, other recent presidents have overcome electability concerns. Uh, the question of Clinton. Now, this is 1992. 1992, uh, so-called social media was not as mature as it is today, not as pervasive. There were other kinds of problems there. Uh, Clinton uh, had to deal with a litany of controversies, including a rampant womanizing. People don't listen to... (coughs) Excuse me. Don't... (coughs) Don't... uh, pay that much attention to that. D.J. Trump approved that uh, with the uh, um, soap opera uh, scene there, and I don't remember the show right now, but anyway, they put that out in D.J. Trump's campaign. It would have uh, fooled uh, many, many people. And this whole thing uh, with uh, Bill Clinton as a quote-unquote uh, dodging the draft in Vietnam, well, same thing came out with... Uh, <clears throat> D.J. Trump, but it was later in the cycle. What I mean by that is in the year cycle, Vietnam was pretty much forgotten. And what happens is people tend to overlook flaws in their uh, candidates, the true believers. And uh, D.J. Trump was able to attract enough hardcore or true believers that make America first, uh, make America great again, uh, was a... Uh, a campaign uh, slogan that 
<clears throat> was uh, driven home to them. And let me see if I can finish this up here. Yeah, okay. Uh, I was getting to where Pinhead Pin wrote this uh, memorandum here. One of oh, it marked Pinhead Pin. He's now running the uh, Harris Poll. Uh, it's not the Harris Poll of old. Wrote in a memo in the early stages of 2006, uh, 2008, sorry about that, including observation of her uh, chief rival, Obama, was unelectable except perhaps against uh, Attila the Hun, where any African American could win a general election, was a theme that hovered in uh, 2000. In 18, but Barack Obama was not an ordinary African American. And I think we, uh, uh, former uh, President uh, Ford, late President Ford, saying of his uh, 1976 rival, uh, Ronald Reagan, as part of the same interview cited above every place I go, every place I hear, there is a growing, a growing sentiment that uh, Governor Reagan can't be win this election Ford who at the time uh, was uh, still considering running again watched as Reagan won the nomination uh, with uh, and the presidency reorienting American politics toward the very uh, conservatism that uh, Ford and others saw as uh, unelectable <clears throat> well Reagan basically this sounded some of the themes he went to Pittsburgh uh, Mississippi and reignited the South and uh, with his base at the time out of Orange County in California. He was able to carry California. So it was a different situation, but it was a very, very close election in terms of the numbers, and John Anderson was running as a third-party candidate in that 1980 uh, election. Uh, 1980 election, if my serves me right, Anderson's still alive. It's in the Alabama, Illinois. He was a so-called moderate Republican. There are none of those people around anymore. The bottom line, there are a lot of candidates who seemed unelectable until uh, they are actually elected. Polls amongst uh, un uh, almost universally show uh, Joe Biden as being uh, better against uh, Trump in a hypothetical 2020 race. Similar polls during 2015 uh, after DJ Trump uh, took the lead uh, showed his performance poorly against uh, Hillary Clinton. Well, it didn't, it didn't. Uh, what he was able to do was it was all about a turnout. He turned the people out. She didn't. Could uh, uh, Jeb Bush had uh, done that or uh, Ted Lyon Cruz or Marco Rubio? Not Marco Rubio, not Lyon Cruz. Uh, perhaps uh, Jeb Bush uh, would have been able uh, to uh, do it, but again, he's a different part being a very conservative governor in uh, Florida, otherwise known as Baby Bush, I think he's about six four, six five. You know, uh, but uh, maybe uh, those other Republicans would have uh, hemorrhaged as much uh, support uh, in uh, some affluent suburban areas in states, and they would have, uh, they wouldn't have won uh, in a different, uh, more uh, traditional way. We can assess uh, elections are not uh, sim uh, are not simulations. One can run over and over again uh, to uh, test the performance of uh, different candidates. Let me just move on here. I'm spending a little t more time than I want. This is one a longer report than they usually make. That may end up being the case. There are a few uh, factors Democrats should consider before coming. To that conclusion, one thing self identified conservatives still outnumber uh, liberals uh, in uh, the general uh, public, no doubt about that. But it depends on how you define uh, liberals. Uh, liberals are one thing, progressives are another thing, so it depends on how it's going. But the movement is growing, there's no doubt about that. Tr uh, but Trump uh, also subverted the usual. Uh, Republican message on other areas, even though he uh, did not actually oppose the Iraq war when it started. It was in uh, 2003. Uh, he pitched himself in 16 as an opponent of that war, uh, and he was able to get people that were opposed to was 
he denounced uh, Colin uh, Kopenek. That was uh, basically akin, a little bit different, akin to Sister Soldier uh, remark uh, by Bill Clinton playing on race. Colin Kopenek was much more uh, known uh, to the segment of population he wanted to get, which was European uh, males. He was a man that started the kneel down uh, movement in the NFL. So he was able to exploit that somewhat akin to uh, what uh, the first President Bush uh, did uh, with uh, Willie Horton. Uh, William Horton out of Boston when our own uh, governor uh, was uh, was uh, running uh, in that uh, particular race. Anyway, let me move on down. Logically, the most electable Democrat would be able to claw back uh, some uh, Trump of voters, there's no doubt about that. Bernie Sanders could do that. A big question as to which would be the most effective. A lot of that would depend on where those job numbers are. If the job numbers are bad, Bernie is the man. If they're so-so, you never know. There are other candidates out there also, and we'll get to those. That said, Bernie Sanders is always going after... uh, Biden uh, for his uh, votes to authorize the Iraq war. Uh, NAFTA NAFTA resonates with a trade union of people uh, out there. That was one of the things that uh, the uh, neoliberals uh, have been trying to do, run these various schemes. That was the Pacific Agreement, and uh, Trump just uh, abandoned it. At the same time, it could also be possible that a Democrat who did emphasize uh, racial justice issues could uh, generate a better uh, turnout amongst uh, non-white voters. Now, <coughs> excuse me, that is very important. And that's something D.J. Trump's uh, campaigns even experimenting in Florida by uh, trying to turn out people that had been disenfranchised, in other words, jailbirds. Now, um, electorally important uh, cities like Detroit and Milwaukee and of Philadelphia to overcome uh, Trump in uh, the countrysides of Michigan, Wisconsin, and uh, Pennsylvania. Well, Pennsylvania, you know, you go out to western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh area, that area, Biden is from uh, Stratton. Uh, so in other words, yeah, he'd be able to turn out the area and he'd go into Philadelphia and do uh, well. So that's a very interesting situation there. <coughs> so could Bernie Sanders. And Elizabeth Warren, let's move on to that piece because we're kind of running a little low on the selectability thing. Electability is basically an idea of the past, not of uh, now. Let me get uh, what happened yesterday so I can get out of the way here. Facebook banned Alex Jones and uh, the Honorable uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan of Chicago and others from its uh, service that was on uh, Wednesday. Uh, Jones uh, basically said he's found of Infowars that he was on over 200 radio stations. I didn't know that. But, uh, yeah, and uh, TV, a lot of TV stations. So, in other words, he has a presence whether it's on Facebook or not. Other people, when we all went to that, uh, Laura Loomer, um, Paul Joseph Watson, and Paul... Neelan, uh, Neelan, anyway, uh, one of the uh, white supremacist types running around there, and also this Milo, uh, where he, his name go, uh, uh, it's a Greek name, sometimes I pronounce this, another don't, and the Times, this is the New York Times, goes on, this is the difficulty applying its rules consistently across this network of more than 2.7 billion people who regularly use Facebook, Messenger, uh, Instagram, and WhatsApp. WhatsApp's being used, incidentally, uh, in the Indian election, uh, because, again, uh, handsets or mobile phones are relatively inexpensive, and uh, time is relatively inexpensive. So out in the outback of India, you have people that are getting their political information off of WhatsApp, but this situation is very interesting in itself. Some other people, uh, news outfits, I should say, reported that Minister Farrakhan was an outliner in this whole 
uh, situation here sort of just thrown in. Same thing Jones said was thrown in there to put icing on the cake. Now it's a very interesting situation. They said in the last year the minister had made uh, several uh, remarks that could be called anti-Semitic. The minister Farrakhan uh, has not changed his uh, speaking pattern, attack lines, etc. in the last 40 years. So nothing is new there. What the reaction uh, will be uh, from followers of OJ7, very interesting. Snoop Dogg uh, put out a video, we looked at it, and uh, Snoop Dogg was not uh, very, very happy about it. And he said it was unjust. Now what uh, the minister and Nation of Islam will do, it will be very interesting. Uh, I'm assuming they will eventually call a news conference and uh, possibly a litigation. Now that is a very different situation because what they accused the minister of doing there was a rhetoric, basically speaking, uh, any what they call anti-Semitism. But again, he's aligned with the uh, Palestinian cause. All political there, political speech is uh, covered uh, by the First Amendment, and I've seen uh, cases before that uh, turned out. It was when cities were uh, having uh, were adopting anti-hate ordinances and they didn't stand the test of time in the courts. Now, but if you go into some of these groups that actually advocate violence and people that follow them have committed violence, uh, terrorist groups, that's a different situation there. Where Jones will stand, who knows? Uh, Jones uh, probably won't do anything at all because he is on over 200 uh, radio stations. So in other words, the mic is on the uh, is on the run. What the conservatives will do about this, and this is where uh, the rubber meets the road, so to speak. The same types of rhetoric and little different tones have been uh, de- deployed by none other than DJ Trump himself, referring uh, to uh, Zionist uh, slash it was uh, one of his uh, I think his economic advisor as a globalist. That is a shorthand for saying basically that Jewish people control the world. A financial system is uh, what he was saying there. And that effectively, uh, if you start getting at that, and uh, DJ is still on Facebook and definitely he's on uh, Twitter, so you start having problems there. You're getting into the First Amendment. You're getting into a very contentious, long, drawn-out legal battle with Facebook, and Facebook at the same time could effectively lose millions of uh, users. They will go elsewhere, and there'll be other applications. We've always advocated. We did at one time have an open source type Facebook, uh, and it uh, sort of floundered. But the situation is, as uh, things mature, we'll see those things uh, come back. And also you talk about global growth when you talk about 2 million plus, a billion, excuse me, plus uh, people. It has to grow in uh, China, in India, in places of that nature, and in, in many of the African nations. Now how they react in the diaspora, and you're talking about places like Brazil, etc. And the criticism that's come out of uh, Venezuela, uh, we, uh, we'll, we'll mention that very quickly, but the so-called coup d'etat announced by the puppet Juan Guaido uh, did not materialize period so we don't know where he is uh, his people didn't come out that is one of the things we'll get to that on the the week uh, that was okay and let me go here I'll flip back to uh, Venezuela here. Cracks appeared in the so-called bipartisan unit. unit. This is from Reuters over Venezuela. And uh, Juan Guaido and a company. Cracks appear in the bipartisan corporation. And that includes Joe Biden. I was uh, going along there. Uh, Senator Medendez out of uh, New Jersey. He's a uh, Top Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee said Washington must work harder to convince uh, foreign partners to back uh, 
multilateral economic uh, sanctions against uh, Venezuela. A few countries have matched the harsh punitive measures against Venezuela's vital oil sector and its banks. The sanctions uh, uh, we have are uh, unilateral. They're important. Uh, Medinda has said um, told reporters but the U.S. shouldn't uh, internationalize those sanctions. Should, excuse me, international sanctions, isolating uh, Russian Federation, Cuba, the bad actors in Venezuela. I think uh, they could have uh, changed the dynamic uh, significantly. Most Western countries have backed uh, the puppet, Guaido, uh, but uh, President Maduro remains uh, has the support of uh, the Russian Federation, uh, China, and numerous others across the. Uh, Board, Cuba, Bolivia, etc. So there are a lot of nations out there and in the Caribbean that actually support the government in Caracas. So that is a situation there. Asked whether he was disappointed with the outcome. This is Marco Vegas Rubio, one of the big drummers there, who played a key role in uh, pushing uh, Trump's anti uh, Maduro approach. Uh, no, because I think it was a mistake to view it as a one-day event. Well, it's not that he viewed it as that. Uh, Juan Guaido and his uh, lackeys accused that of of doing that. Incidentally, one of his henchmen, or mentors, or Lopez, uh, ran off the day after appearing with him, and he's in the Spanish uh, consulate now, and supposedly someone uh, raided his house, and guess what? The books came off the shelf. And Nietzsche and uh, Moncon. That's by Adolf Schicken Group, otherwise known as Hitler. So much for that one. And well, let's see. I guess we'll go to uh, Nate Silver now. Let me just look at the time here. Okay, we're running low on time. But anyway, the silver bullet, the union vote, vote could uh, swing the election. This is uh, by Nate Silver himself on the... When did he put it up here? Second of May. Bullet point one, the union vote could be key in uh, both the primary and general election. Unionized voters were essential in helping uh, Hillary Monster Clinton main her lead over Bernie Sanders, although a handful of major unions did endorse uh, Bernie Sanders. But the uh, NEA and uh, SELF and uh, AXME and the UFCW and the UAW, they endorsed uh, Clinton, but uh, that's not the whole uh, story there. The firefighters, incidentally, came out and endorsed uh, Joe Lunchbox uh, Biden, but they also en- endorsed Brother K- uh, Kerry, I remember that going on, and the president of the firefighters at the time was one of the principal places going around. Now, this is a look, uh, union voters shifted towards uh, Trump, in 216, in 212, Barack Obama uh, got 86 uh, percent of the vote, 230 for Willard Romney, and in 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton at 55.2, and uh, DJ Trump at 38.4, an improvement of their, <coughs> excuse me, of their of 16.7. And European uh, men in trade unions, Barack Obama got 52%, which is uh, respectable. And Hillary Clinton only got 40%. Willard Romney got 41%. And D.J. Trump got 52.5%, a negative 11.9%. And European women in unions, Barack Obama at 64%. Willard Romney, <coughs> excuse me, at 31%. Hillary Clinton at 55.7%. Uh, and D.J. Trump was at 38.6%. You can see where that was going. In fact, the shift among union voters was enough to swing the election to Trump. That's according to the standard uh, study. Barack Obama won the uh, union vote by 34.4%. In 212, but Clinton uh, did only uh, 16.7%. I told you sort of where that was going. 
that was roughly an 18 point swing uh, was worth a net of 1.2 uh, percent for DJ Trump in Pennsylvania 1.1 percent in Wisconsin and 1.7 percent in Michigan that tells you where the union membership uh, went is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren's outspokenness on impeachment driving her uh, mini uh, poll surge uh, If it wasn't uh, for Biden's uh, poll surge, everyone would be talking about Elizabeth Warren. Well, uh, that is not a surprise. Elizabeth Warren has uh, one of the best, if not best, ground organizations in this primary. So watch out for Elizabeth. Even surprising Sanders for second place in one of, is in one of the polls. But it's uh, very, very early there. Uh, period. Based on uh, what you know, do you think Congress should or should not uh, begin impeachment? Well, that's a very wild card situation there. Uh, most of the voters have not come around to that position uh, yet. Uh, 37%, very, very low right there. Uh, counter argument, it's not clear that impeachment is the highest priority for Democrats as from CNN I wouldn't watch CNN anyway stop complaining about this is a sample size there was evidently a CNN poll of uh, what 411 people and uh, according to Silver here the erroneous claim that it uh, hadn't surveyed voters on the age of 50 when it had probably not very many I'd have to look at the cross tabs there isn't a huge size, no doubt about it. Fairly typical of uh, as uh, polls go, especially for high-quality uh, polls like uh, CNN. Well, CNN has been correct before. The Democratic electorate contains a lot of voters that are hard to reach, such as college students, Latinos, but they do come out uh, for Bernie Sanders. And all of that, plus uh, even declining survey response rates, yeah, they're, they're really declining, no doubt about that. But complaining about side sample, excuse me, side sample doesn't make sense. CNN wasn't the only poll there, no doubt about that. Uh, the Morning Consult, that's a very, very large poll, but it um, can be rigged also. 15,000 there. I've always been very suspicious of very large polls. Now even smaller uh, uh, polling samples uh, are not, excuse me, now are uh, small uh, polling samples quite as error prone as you might think. Uh, the margin of error uh, in polls depends not only on the sample size, but also on how many people uh, chose a particular option, uh, no doubt there. For instance, a candidate uh, at 15% about where Sanders is the uh, margin of error is uh, comparatively modest, uh, a plus or minus 3.5%, even if it's uh, 400 people. <coughs> it, it could uh, could not be. It's, it's hard to say here without looking at the cross tabs. We aren't looking at them there. Now, the Biden bounced. Uh, this is where we'll conclude and go to the sports. He launched his campaign with the firefighters, no doubt about that. And his uh, support, well ahead, he's at 39%, up 11 points from 28, and that was in the CNN. Quinnipiac University had Biden up uh, a similar 38 uh, points there. The morning uh, consult uh, had Biden at 36 uh, from, uh, in other words, gained 6 points there. This Harris X poll, that's the one that for Scott Rasmussen.com. Remember him with the Rasmussen poll? He fell out with them and there are other people not named Rasmussen running. That poll now at 33% from uh, 39% last month. The uh, Harris X uh, still has uh, Bernie in uh, second place. You can tell that the people at the Crystal Ball don't like uh, Bernie Sanders. But, and nonetheless, these <clears throat> what the polls indicate, it basically is, Elizabeth Warren was moving up. Now, this New Hampshire poll, this is Suffolk University, we looked at it, uh, released the poll on a Tuesday. 
and Biden uh, was in first place with 20%, that's very low uh, there, and with Sanders and uh, Willard Judge at uh, New Hampshire's quite conservative state, tied for second place uh, at 12%, and Elizabeth Warren at 8% in that poll. But it's still too early. Some of these people in the single digits, and a bunch of them, uh, even uh, that senator out of uh, Colorado, uh, Michael, I want to get to get his name here, is uh, running uh, for president now, along with Hickenlooper and various other characters. Bad early polls spell uh, trouble for well known candidates' average support in polls uh, taken in the first half. Of the year before the primaries. Now, this is from uh, 1972 to 2016 on name recognition, etc. Not well known. Uh, I've outdone the well knowns. That's the old proverbial thing. You usually don't want to be leading too early in the situation. And again, to uh, Carmela Harris, not as well known than our, is uh, Beto O'Rourke out of El Paso, Texas at this point in time. Now, this uh, <clears throat> Mia Peter Budergan, as he's known, I hope Budergan, uh, is known, has been up there, but he is a conservative. Be leery of him. Those are Warren's in an intriguing position. Warren's a candidate who we thought uh, would have uh, released uh, overlap uh, with Biden. Well, Elizabeth Warren is very well known. She has very good uh, policy positions out there, no doubt about that. She's a person that uh, literally th- the brain uh, behind the Consumer Protection uh, Agency, uh, period. A showdown between Biden and Brutigan, our, our uh, Beto O'Rourke, uh, could also uh, leave uh, big segments of the uh, party unhappy. Well, the showdown has to come, because when you have this many candidates out there, you're going to get the attack. Now, it'll be interesting to see these attacks are coming early, which they are. Uh, they have started attacking Biden. Will that knock him down or push him up? It'd be hard to say, but uh, this all uh, turns out to be a race, or could turn out to be a race, probably will, very similar to the one that D.J. Trump, G.J. Trump ran against all these opponents. Uh, and we'll start to see that happening. This means I am uh, demoting uh, what Harris, Sanders, and Brutigan from uh, the uh, top tier. We'll look at these tiers very quickly into the sports. Now, his tier, he has Biden as an E, and then he has the others down there, Harris, uh, Sanders, Brutigan, and uh, Warren as C. And then his second tier is Beto O'Rourke, uh, Twitter King, Booker, Amy Klobuchar, and Abrams. He shouldn't be there. And then in the third ring, uh, Julian Castro, uh, Inslee. Uh, and then way down there is Hickenlooper and company there. So that is a, a little different uh, on its own. We'll go do uh, sports now. And as we segue away here... So basically, what I guess what we've learned in this presentation is Joe Biden is in the race. He has moved up, but that's not unusual there. Uh, that uh, could happen any time. Let's go to sports and NBA here. The 76 is 116 uh, to 95 for the Toronto Raptors. They lead the series 2-1, to one, which we fully expected. And the uh, Eastern, the Bucks and the Celts, uh, that'll be tonight, are uh, tied up 1-1 in the uh, NBA. And so, it's time to go to Major League Baseball. Reds and Mets. Mets, one zip in that contest. Padres in Atlanta. Padres 11 to 2. The Astros and the Twins. It was the Twins this time, 8 to 2 there. A slug fest, I guess, of sorts on the Twins side. The Twins had 8 hits. The Astros, uh, 10 hits, the Astros had 8. The Rockies and a Brewers in Milwaukee. The uh, Rockies 11 to 6. Brewers were losing some games lately. The Rays and Royals in Kansas City. Rays 3 to 1. 
the Cardinals and Nationals uh, in D.C. The Nationals 2-1 to one there. And a game I uh, watched, uh, White Sox, Red Sox, White Sox 6-4, to four, walk off uh, home run there. And finally, the Angels 6-2 to two over the Blue Jays. Uh, let me just take a quick look. I didn't see anything going on over in the National Hockey League. But, uh, oh, well, what's going on over there? No doubt about that. Um, the Bruins are 4-1 to final over the Blue Jackets. And this is the uh, second round uh, in the East, Game 4. It's all tied up 2-2. The Sharks in Avalanche. The Avalanche 3-1. to This is in the West. Game 4. That series also tied up 2-2. There. Well, this will do it uh, for us. Have a good weekend, everyone. We'll see you on the uh, week that was, and we'll talk about the week's events, including Joe Biden. We'll uh, hear, no doubt, from uh, Charlie uh, Cook. And we'll have numbers, man. We'll talk about the Fed and the job numbers and where that's going. We'll have special programming on uh, the Oracle of Omaha's Bircher Halfway patterned uh, Woodstock uh, for the financial community. It's an interesting situation. You should get out there and go to it. That's where you'll have Warren Buffett, who is 88, and Charlie Munger, who is 90-whatever, sit there for four or five hours and take questions. Very, very unusual. Very in-depth. Yahoo will have it if you you don't get a chance to hear it live. Uh, They will have the recording there. We'll have an edited version. Not sure when that'll be up. It'll be a busy weekend. We'll get to it as uh, soon as we can. And we have a special program coming up sometime next week on the cannabis industry. We'll be spotlighting Willie Nelson and his uh, Willie Reserve, uh, what he has. And if anyone knows cannabis and marijuana, it's Willie. And his... Um, use of a small farm, sustainable agriculture, growing uh, cannabis. We'll look at uh, how cannabis is doing in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and what they're doing for people that have been convicted of actually selling this stuff illegally. And we'll look at some other states. should be a very interesting program there. We still have the black hole. We'll get to it on the production table someplace out there. And uh, several other productions there, uh, we were looking at on BR on the world, looking at Venezuela and what's been going on there. The marches in France uh, with the uh, Gilets Jaunes uh, movement, the Yellow Vest movement. It was out on May Day also. Incidentally, we have a special May Day uh, broadcast up there. We invite you to tune in to it on all the same stations that we're normally on. Stitcher, iHeart, uh, YouTube. We redid YouTube. We were unfortunately on the entertainment. Now we're on the politics. So go to YouTube. Get our audio version there. And we'll see you on the week that was. Boston Red on the 3rd of May 2016. Good day.